the TeachPitch podcast. We are very excited to be launching a series of interviews for TeachPitch, a global community of 50,000 subscribers from over 205 countries to date. And for these interviews, we have selected a number of subscribers who have achieved great things. And by great, I mean amazing. Think of former presidents, entrepreneurs, people who've built hospitals, huge nonprofit organizations, successful journalists, doctors, etc. And what all our guests have in common is that despite their great success, they've encountered many enormous challenges. So what were these challenges and how did they overcome them? That's what we're going to be talking about here. My name is Aldo de Pap and I'm massively looking forward and very grateful you can join us on this journey. So sit back, relax and download the podcast here. If we start with problems they care about in their lives, I think the chance of hooking them and in, interesting them in the subject is much higher. And then after that, you say, well, actually, if you want a better answer to how to cycle fast or how to make more money using this computational thinking, it'd be really helpful to know this part of mathematics that was invented 100 years ago that actually really helps you to work these things out better. Yeah. So let's talk about that. And I think then people will be much more engaged from many different strata. In this episode, I speak to our very clever guest about how he was overwhelmed becoming a CEO at the tender age of 21, suddenly having to deal with matters he did not even know they existed. We also talk about why he feels he's in a unique central position to spread the word on radically changing the way we teach and learn mathematics in this world. Enjoy this interview with Conrad Wolfram. We're so happy to be partnering with Hee Ha Ho, an interactive video platform that enables teachers and students to easily create amazing clickable videos for learning. Check out heehaho.com, that's H-I-H-A-H-O.com for more information and your free starter account. A big thank you to our friends at Cezus Maths Challenger the only puzzle that effectively boosts your numeracy, critical thinking, and brain power. Go to cezuspuzzles.com, that is spelled C-Z-E-U-S puzzles.com, to get your brain buzzing. We are so excited to be working with the team Learning Ladders, the only platform that provides assessment that goes way beyond tracking to effectively support teaching and learning for EYFS, primary, and secondary settings. Go to learningladders.info to find out more. Throughout my career as an edtech builder and working with teachers and students over the globe, I've spoken to many people who feel that things need to be done differently in education. Some demand drastic changes, while others say that small incremental alterations will eventually lead to a new, re-energized process of teaching and learning. The people I speak to, some of them have been guests on this podcast, are often holistic thinkers and speak about overall systemic changes and new approaches to education. But my next guest has good reasons to get very specific and change the way we teach and learn one subject that affects us all. Mathematics. Conrad Wolfram has been working for decades on changing the way we teach and learn mathematics in schools. In 2010, he founded computerbasedmathematics.org to end the disconnect between school mathematics and real life, justifiably claiming that we should embrace computers more in the process. In a variety of interviews and talks, Wolfram advocates for us to democratize experience by making full use of the technology tools and automated computational thinking available to us. Computers put great automation levels between the mechanics of math, the calculating, and what you're trying to get done. When the automation gets good, you can go much further by doing it on the machine with a computer than you can by hand. And the subject of the mechanics of calculating becomes a distinct subject from using, applying, or doing math, states Wolfram in an inspiring TED Talk he held back in 2010. In his 2020 book, The Math Fix, an education blueprint for the AI age, Wolfram exposes why maths education is in a global crisis and how the only fix is a fundamentally new mainstream subject. 
after more than 15 years of conceptualizing the idea, 10 years of build-out and 2 years of writing and editing, Conrad Wolfram published the book in June last year. The math fix does not only identify the problem and aligning complaints, but also suggests a clear alternative outlining a four-step process that can be used across the curriculum. Define the questions, abstract them to computable form, compute answers and interpret results. The book was very warmly received and even won an independent press award in education earlier this year. Seemingly, Conrad was born into critical, independent, abstract thinking as both his parents were writers. His mother, Sybil Wolfram, was a fellow and tutor in philosophy at Lady Margaret Hall at the University of Oxford, and his brother Stephen is a well-known physicist, mathematician and computer scientist, who, among others, became a fellow of the American Mathematical Society in 2012. Conrad holds master's degrees in natural sciences and mathematics from Cambridge University and founded the company Wolfram Research Europe Limited in 1991. Together with his brother Stephen, Conrad has also been shaping up the company Wolfram Research since 1996. Among many other things, Conrad has led the effort within his company to move the use of its flagship product called Mathematica from a pure computation system to a development and deployment engine. Needless to say that for this interview, I'm in the company of a great mind that I'm dying to pick for ideas on maths education reform. A very warm welcome to you, Conrad. Thanks very much indeed for that uh, very kind uh, and detailed introduction. Reminds yeah. me of uh, many things in my past, uh, I guess, too. There was so much in there, and as with many of our guests, I needed to omit a lot, but I also wanted to bring a lot in there because you have maths education reform on the one hand, and then your work with Wolfram Research on the other, and then, you know, such a cutting-edge tool as Wolfram Mathematica which is, you know, basically the complete other end. So I really wanted to, to show to the listeners that there are both sides that all have to do with mathematics. Some people might think that contradictory, that on the one hand, I spent my day job, in a sense, uh, trying to automate as much as possible the use of computation for humans, to make it as easy as possible for humans to deploy that computation, whatever they want to do, to make better decisions, in a sense, and in a sense, my, uh, my education reform is to get humans to step up and to be equipped in the right way to handle this new age of computation. So they seem somewhat contradictory, but I think they aren't, because really in all industrial revolutions, effectively, and of course we're in, some people call this current one the fourth industrial revolution, but uh, we're in a kind of major new mechanization. The human ends up, the human that succeeds anyway, ends up, stepping up to the next level. And I think that's very much what we've got to do now and what our education has to support at this time. Mm -hmm. well, that's beautiful that you put it that way, and that's also how many of us experience it, because, you know, a lot of people, they talk about something called the digital skills gap. And, you know, I appreciate it's a lot more basic, but it's the things that we're trying to push to our students in, in the education process doesn't really match with what's out there in the big wide world and kind of the skills that we need to have to thrive in a new uh, digital era and in this new digital economy. And I think in a way that's what you're trying to do on a, on a mathematical level. So it's, a, it's very interesting and, and great that you have examples of both. Yeah, I mean, when I hear the digital skills agenda, I think it's a bit confused between perhaps three different elements. So one element it is, can we somehow use computers better to educate, better to pedagogically deliver the education we're trying to deliver? So that's kind of, you know, one. Are we digitizing the delivery of education? The second one is, you know, digital skills in the sense of can you operate traditional, you know, can you operate standard applications on your computer? You know, you know, Office, for example, Office 365 or, you know, Search and Google and other things that you might do as a day-to-day -day operation of a computer. And the third one, which I think is actually much less brought up in this context, is, is what I'm most interested in, which is the fundamental change that computers have brought to the area of, of computation, as in working out results. Some people might call it mathematical thinking. Some people might call it computational thinking. I don't really care too much what the name is. The essence of it is applying this magnificent, what I count as a four-step problem-solving process, to 
challenges one faces in life, decisions one needs to take, and using that process to come out with better answers than one could otherwise come out with. Yeah. And this process of computation has been kind of completely overturned by, you know, and, and, and in a sense the hint is with the name, right? The computer has fundamentally overturned this process because it's given us mechanization beyond all imagination for being able to actually implement the calculation. And so what that's done is it's meant that we can use this previous to computers being around. Mathematicians often hate me saying this, right? But the fact of the matter is mathematics, which is probably more of what the name was then, wasn't really that useful beyond areas of physics where it worked extremely well. You know, planets going around the sun, that kind of computation. Obviously, things like accountancy, where it had been almost developed to start with in many ways, I and mean, there were many ways and strands in which mathematics was developed, but obviously one was just pure, you know, dealing with money. So there were these strands in life that were very important, but nevertheless were quite stratified in terms of where mathematics was applied. Suddenly the computer comes along, and increasingly, as it's been able to do bigger and bigger calculations, we're now injecting this computational process into basically all areas of life. It underlies everything. And yet, when we look at what's happening in education to equip us for that, it's sort of not present. And that's the third element of, of digital skills, if you want to put it that way, computational thinking that's really not been addressed at all in mainstream education. And what would you say is the biggest impediment that it hasn't been properly adopted in education? Is that an unwillingness? In, I would say it's the ecosystem of education is very stuck, and particularly for changes of content. Mm. And you can see why this is. I mean, I compare it often to, you know, if you wanted to start a, do a startup in, let's say, the, the early 70s, the early 1970s in most countries, it was really hard. It was like, you know, the bankers didn't want to lend you money and, you know, and everything was sort of, you know, badly stuck. It all needed oiling. It needed a change of process. I think in that case, led by the U.S., it suddenly became you know, in vogue to basically do startups. And now virtually every country in the world, even ones you would consider pretty unbusinesslike, are rolling over themselves to say, hey, we're a great place to do startups. Mm -hmm. I think we're back in an equivalent to the 1970s with the way in which our education ecosystem works. So if you take mathematics as an example, mathematics is actually possibly the very worst of all cases in this. Because mathematics is extremely high stakes. People think it's probably the most important mainstream subject. It's measured very quantitatively by an exam system that is increasingly, uh, in a sense, you know, multi-choice and, and closed-ended. Instead of having open-ended questions you really get in life, you tend to get these very closed-ended, you know, the answer's three or the answer's A. And it's also in the midst of... These all these different elements. You've got governments worrying tremendously what happens to mathematics because they see future economy and, and their workforce determined by that. You see parents very stressed about whether their children do well in a maths exam because we've been told by everyone it's the future. You know, if you don't do well in maths, you're screwed for for your future, college, jobs, etc. So there's tremendous pressure on this subject to do well at it, and yet I think it's kind of the wrong subject. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to change that, you've got to change this whole edifice, essentially, of belief structure as to the fact that it's so important. It's very, very hard to do that with a mainstream subject in the, in the current setup. And by the way, it's even enforced further because in recent years we've got excited about comparing different countries' ability through things like PISA to be able to judge which country has done better or worse. Now, that has some value to it for sure. You want to see what best practice is in each place. But, of course, it also locks everything together. So if country A wants to reform their subject fundamentally and say, well, actually, we want to do a different kind of mathematics, let's call it a computer-based mathematics, which is very different, they won't do very well on the PISA scores mm -hmm. because they're tuned in to the previous subject. So there's all this pressure which bears on keeping the subject as it is in a way that I think is extremely unhealthy. So I, I would say it's the biggest issue. That's it. I think the second issue is, is lack of understanding. In a sense, mathematics is like the Ten Commandments, or one of them at least. You know, it's, it, we were told that it was very important from year dot onwards. 
it's very hard to question those things intrinsically. And I talk about this quite a lot in my book, actually, about, you know, it's quite hard to question your sort of belief structure. And mathematics is almost part of that. You know, we're just told that's a central thing as to what you do. And so for most people, it's quite hard when you come along and say, actually, I think it's the wrong thing. and We need to do it differently. Mm -hmm. I found the reaction to that in many places actually very, very positive. But it takes people two or three goes for them to really sink in and think about it. It's not a sort of one headline hit in order to get that change. Mm -hmm. To my idea, what you're saying is let's start by making it more experience based. Let's look at why, you know, why we were teaching mathematics in the first place. Which yes. skills do we need to have to, to actually apply mathematics into our daily lives in the, in the future? So Correct. has that something to do with it? What's happened here is the subject matter has got completely out of alignment with what's required in the real world. And the problem is the outside world has fundamentally changed because of this new mechanization. And let me explain that a little bit further because I think it will help people understand. So I mentioned this four-step process that I consider computational thinking or mathematical thinking to be. And really, that's, that's the following steps. It's first, you take a problem in step one and define it more precisely. And sometimes when I'm giving talks, when I'm allowed again to give talks in real auditoria, uh, I sometimes say to people, you know, a typical problem could be if we, if, and I'm making a bunch of assumptions, if we manage to lock the room down, turn its air conditioning off, you know, seal it, and I talk for too long, what will go wrong and what will be the limiting factor? How long can I talk before everything goes wrong? Right, so that might be the definitional question. Step two is you abstract that. You say, okay, I've got my question. I want to turn that question in English, so to speak, into maths. And why is that important? It's important because we have this incredibly fantastic language we've built up, this abstract representation of ideas that we've built up with uh, mathematics over hundreds of years that can take a question and turn it into an answer through this magic step of, of calculating the answer and get us a very much more precise answer than we could usually get just by talking about it. So, so step two is to set that up. Maybe it will be an equation in this case. Mm -hmm. Step three is you take that question and you compute, as I described, to get an answer. And you get an abstract answer, you know, x equals three or something. And step four is that you say, okay, x equals three. Does that answer my original question? Maybe that was supposed to be three hours. Is that a possible thing? Now, in fact, are there other questions? It might be three hours for some people because they run out of air. But for other people, it might be maybe they're you know, diabetic or something and they have an earlier requirement than running out of air, et cetera, et cetera. So there may be many, many other questions. We may have to go around the loop again, interpret in different ways. The key problem at the moment in education is step three is the step now that computers do fantastically well, much better than humans have ever done and much better than anybody might have imagined they would even do a few years ago. Steps one, two, and four are mostly very human processes still and ones that we do far too little of in education. So what we need to do is far more complex problems, much earlier for students, that much more match their real life and what they will be using this mathematics for in the future to make complex, messy decisions, but allow the computer to do step three. And that's the big change that's caused our education to be approximately 80% out of alignment, in my judgment, with the outside world. Yeah. Because in step three, there's a lot of the memorizing, the kind of abstract thinking that you, you don't even know why, but you, you need to kind of push it into a formula. And you're saying computers can do that a lot better. So why don't we focus on step one, two, and four and let, uh, let, let technology do step three? Because after all, technology or computers are a human invention. You know, it's there for a reason. We're not mining uh, very well into all the potential that computers have given us, right? Um, what would you say to people that, because this is maybe the skeptic in me, and for a small part, you know, as a former teacher, the apocalypse now scenario that computers will take over, <laughs> or that we need to stay smarter than computers because we don't want this um, this era whereby you know, technology is ruling the world and human beings are not, or, or AI, that's also such a buzzword that artificial intelligence is, is, is going to dominate uh, the world. What would you say to those people? So the way that humans will remain in charge is by getting the educational know-how to work with the computer, in a sense, as the computer is an employee, not the computer as their manager. Hmm. And in a sense... 
we need to think about a future world where you've got a kind of hybrid intelligence being used between people and, and the machines and the computers. And I, I believe that a much bigger fraction of our population could be the managers of those computers than will naturally be the case if we don't do anything about our education. I mean, there are several ways to look at this. I mean, another way to look at it is most things that are sort of procedural things, even if they're currently quite messy, hard procedures, will be taken over by computers and AIs at some point. Hmm. So what you want is the human creativity element that computers have not yet really spawned. You want the sort of different way that humans think about things. In the end, we want a world in which the end result is for the human, not for the yeah. computer. Right? I mean, that's yeah. where we want to be. So in the end, yeah. humans are very much wrapped into this process. And what I'm arguing for is at least a major element of the requirement to make this a reality, in my view. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, by the way, it's just that, though. I'm arguing also for something that I think fundamentally underlies stability of, of our societies, I have to say. Yeah. And if you look back, I don't know, a couple of hundred years, there were arguments about whether there were people suggesting mass literacy was an important idea. And there were many, many people saying this made no sense. You know, there were a small number of people who were literate. We didn't really need more people who were fully literate. People were either too stupid or, you know, there was no point in having the whole population literate. It wasn't doing. Now, I think mass literacy has been one of the most empowering ideas of, of education, basically, mm -hmm. in, in the you know, recent times. Mm -hmm. I'm arguing now for a new era of sort of mass computational literacy, which I think we're due. And I think that there are quite a few similarities. I mean, at the moment, we have, in a sense, high priests and aristocrats of data science and, uh, and other computational areas. And for the most of the population, they're telling us what to believe because we can't really separately verify, think about that, because we don't really have the educational wherewithal to do that. And I'm arguing that we need it. That doesn't mean everybody needs to become a, you know, top class, uh, you know, mathematical modeler. But it means that everyone needs to have an instinct to feel confidence about dealing with those sorts of issues, confidence to challenge expertise in a positive and sensible, logical way. Otherwise, we get totally illogical challenge, as we've often seen recently in our democracies to some of the modern technologies we have. Thank you for, for going into detail and, and diving into that a little deeper. We're going to also dive into your challenges. As your first challenge, and I think it's very interesting, you write that you became a CEO, which I think is Wolf Ram Research Limited Europe. You founded that company and became its CEO at age 21. And you write that as a challenge. Uh, why? <laughs> Well, it was a bit daunting in a way, right? I mean, you know, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, to be honest. Mm. You know, I popped out of Cambridge University. My dad was, this, you know, ran a company, but not in technology or anything like that, actually in textile yarn. So it wasn't exactly the same thing. Obviously, my brother had started Wolfram three years earlier. So, I mean, I had some sort of, you know, family credentials, so to speak, in understanding something about businesses that some people might not have had. But in the end, you know, I didn't take a course in management. I had a physics and math degree. So I had to figure stuff out as I went. And it was a challenge because, you know, I, I didn't know. Certain things scared me more than they should have done. Certain things I didn't take as seriously as I should have done then and see mistakes. But overall, it was interesting because I think I applied fairly computational thinking to how to run a company. It wasn't explicitly I was going through those four steps, but it was a sort of there was a way of thinking that you get used to when you're doing physics and math and things like that, that I think is really beneficial to a modern way of thinking about business. Mm -hmm. So it was a challenge to do that. And I mean, you know, I remember, I guess like everybody has who manages companies, there were things like, um, I remember when I had to let, the first time I had to let somebody go, I remember practicing firing my parents, for example, uh, <laughs> as, you know, a mm -hmm. practice run of what to do and things like this. I think, if there's one word I would attach to what helped me in that, it was confidence. Mm. I think confidence to be able to stand on your own two feet, not arrogance so much, it's just confidence to believe that you might know what you're doing, you're going to try it, you're not going to be immune to suggestions or other ideas, but also not to believe what everybody tells you to do when you don't really understand it. Confidence when you don't understand something to say or to push back on it. 
I mean, I see this in the UK quite a lot, actually. When people go to, you know, private schools and things like that, often the thing that they get most of all things there, I mean, they might get better teachers in some cases. Maybe they don't. Maybe they do. You know, who knows? They might get uh, more resources, bigger swimming pool or something. But actually, the thing that's really it is when they are left with, feeling like they can stand on their own two feet and be confident. And I, there's no reason really why it's only those sorts of institutions that needs to produce that. Mm-hmm. I think that there are a lot of things we can do in other institutions, all institutions. It's not particularly a thing that costs money. It's a thing that has a particular way of thinking about it more than that costs money. Yeah. You just mentioned the example of yeah, you needed to let go your first employee, sadly, and you practice that with your parents. I've written down in preparation of this interview, what were things like at the Wolfram dinner table? Because, you know, your brother being so entrepreneurial, both your parents being authors, being writers, I mean, they sound like very entrepreneurial themselves. So what were things like uh, for you growing up? Well, I mean, my my brother was for a long time, because my brother had left for the U.S. when I was, uh, I mean, he's 11 years older than me, and he left when he was 18. So he was often not at the, the physical dinner, dinner table that that often, more on the phone. But um, I think we had a very argumentative sort of intellectual style of discourse. I mean, there was certainly no problem at not believing what you're told by people, uh, certainly not believing the perceived wisdom, so to speak. Certainly there was no problem at challenging your parents hard in my case. I mean, that was a, absolutely a Wolfram kind of thing. And I see it also with my daughter. Uh, you don't get an easy time as a Wolfram parent in terms of being out logic uh, from your from your six year old or whatever it is. So I think that was the gen- and again I think that you know I suppose my parents were quite uh, easy going in many respects. I mean what, one interesting thing I mean although my parents you know, my mother was as you mentioned uh, in fact she was an admissions teacher at some point at Oxford she's a philosophy don she understood the difference between good exam results and being good at a subject or being intelligent. So she didn't immediately think, you know, if I messed up an exam, that somehow, you know, I was no good at that subject or that I was stupid or any of those things. And I think that is sadly missing now in a lot of what we have. And, and, you know, we have a lot of parents who are terribly concerned about exams, and I totally understand why that is. But we need to look a lot deeper and, and give our children a bit more space on those things. That's good. And I think that also led you to start a company at 21 because it's, it's very young, right? And uh, I started a company, uh, you know, myself seven years ago. Uh, so I was uh, 34 at the time. And I 100% agree with you that the confidence is very important. There are a lot of things coming at you that you've never, you know, you've never dealt with in your life from the accountant to, you know, uh, things like companies, house, taxes, uh, kind of all tangential you know, with with yeah. the real activity that you want to do, but you all need to address it, you all need to do it. And moreover, then at a certain point, people are starting to rely on you. They think you have all the answers, but you don't, right? You're also just figuring things out. And you're you're at a certain point in a position that your, uh, you know, families are dependent on you because people work for you, you pay them the salary, so you, you want right. to make it work. So it's a lot of pressure at a young age. And it's something that I believe you can only you know, really properly learn through experience. It's the experience of, of being an entrepreneur, of, of dealing with a company. It's not something necessarily you can read in a book. So if anything, I think schools should facilitate, you know, workshops or practical courses on, on how to do it, whereby, you know, students actually go into the mud, right? You know, get their hands dirty, and, and if they fail, that's fine, but then at least they've learned something rather than making this a theoretical exercise. But, you know, that's, yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with this. One of the other aspects of I think it also realigns. I mean, we've got an awful lot of people, I mean, particularly with respect to math, who are kind of disenfranchised by the current school education model. And we have a huge cohort of the population who, you know, are told maths is critical, but then they don't think they're any good at it. You know, they're told they're no good at it. There's a problem. They're not as good as other people, etc. And it's this very quantitative measurement of it that also makes that very... Uh, very stark. So I agree with you. I think starting from real experiences, I mean, I suppose, you know, people ask me sometimes, what do I think education is actually for? As I say in my book, over hundreds of years, there have been many, many different theories, you know, you know thousands of years even as to the point of it. I mean, I, I suppose my simplest summary is to enrich life. 
you know, in order to do that, I think you've got to start from the sort of experience that you think you're going to need in life. I suppose a sort of subtitle to why you need education is, you know, is to accelerate experience of things that you're actually going to come across. You know, if you take, you know, becoming a CEO at a young age that we were just talking about, I mean, I think there were certain things in my education that did accelerate my experience of that until I actually had to hit the real thing. But there are many more things we could do to accelerate that experience, which I think also, coincidentally, many of our students would find a lot more exciting than the theory first. So one of the things I, I certainly think with mathematics, but also with other subjects is, let's not typically do abstract first. Let's start from the experience that might connect with your life as a student. Because most students, particularly, and I think this is particularly true of more disadvantaged groups, I think, as you've pointed out, I came from a fairly academic background. I think one thing that gives you, on average, is the ability to push through abstraction. Sort of, you have a certain kind of confidence, I guess, to push through the abstraction before you see what the point is. And yeah. you're used to, in my case, discussing with my parents things in a very abstract way before I actually see how it affects my life. Now, I think that's something that you sometimes don't get in more disadvantaged groups. It doesn't mean they're any worse at the abstraction. It just means that they don't necessarily have the confidence to push through that. So if you therefore start with the abstraction first, you'll lose them. Yeah. And I think that's exactly what's happening. I think if we start with problems they care about in their lives. I think the chance of hooking them and in, interesting them in the subject is much higher. And then after that, you say, well, actually, if you want a better answer to how to cycle fast or how to make more money using this theory of making money, using this computational thinking, it'd be really helpful to know this part of mathematics that was invented 100 years ago that actually really helps you to work these things out better. Yeah. So let's talk about that. And I think then people will be much more engaged from many different strata. Yeah, what it also reminds me of is that I think that in education, sometimes understanding and memorizing is confused with one another. And I think one is a consequence of another that we feel that, you know, if we know it by heart, at a certain point, we must understand it. Whereas I think, particularly with mathematics, that's not how this works. You can have it memorized, you can dream it, but there's still, if you don't get the right abstraction level of it, it won't ring a bell. It won't do anything with you or for you. So I think we need to focus a lot more on the understanding rather than on, on the memorizing part in schools. Well, and particularly as you can go, you know, on the web at any time and go and look up most of the, yeah, quotes correct. direct knowledge that you actually yeah. need to find. Yeah. And obviously, you have to qualify it. Just because it's written there doesn't mean it's true. But yeah. that, again, is part of the skill we need to build in, the skepticism. But as you say, that just the direct knowing, just for the sake of knowing, is much less important just because we've got machines and is much less where we as humans need to be with our skill sets. And, and you're completely right. I mean, the thing is, it's often confused, though, when people talk about education because people say you need to be on the side of just understanding stuff and not knowing. And people say, no, you need to know the facts. You do need to know stuff. I mean, you do need to know in mathematics when you can use equations, when you can use machine learning. You know, you need to get experience that you need to understand it, but you also need to just know it. You need to know what the words mean at some yeah. level. We don't need to wrote learn the same set of things as we wrote learned 50 years ago. And yeah. it's not helpful to do that. And, and the balance of rote learning to actually applying and experiencing with more complicated things has totally changed as well. Yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, it's one of the things I would say also that we've been very engaged in. Again, I'm thinking about it just in the section of mathematics and computation, but I think it applies more generally across education. Is We looked at the outcomes that countries around the world set for mathematics. Because in the end, you know, you're teaching people mathematics, I don't know, for 10 plus years of their life. Presumably, you're trying to achieve certain outcomes by so doing. Mm -hmm. What are those outcomes? When you look at the outcomes listed by most countries, it's pretty disappointing. Mm -hmm. They are things like, well, you know, at some level, we'd like critical thinking. Well, sure, we can all agree about that. And then you could go to a section, you know, 3.2.2 of the, of the document, and it says, well, you know, it's very important the student knows how to put ticks on bar charts in the right place. And you think, well, sure, but it seems like there's something missing between those yeah. two, the, the sort yeah. of vague aspiration and the detail. And so we have been building for computational thinking an outcomes list, which is sort of 11-dimensional outcomes list you, you can find on our website. 
which I think has been rather interesting for many people to try and lay out, you know, things like confidence to tackle new problems, instinctive feel of computational math, you know, interpreting and verifying results, these sorts of headings, which are more general than those. But obviously you need to know the detailed actual tool sets and concepts that you might deploy as well as part of that. So that sounds like very valuable material, and I'm so happy that you're facilitating so much resources so people can have a look and understand. I mean, uh, as I said in my intro, you're not only complaining, you're also <laughs> offering a tangible alternative as to, you know, how we should properly deal with this. And that brings us to our second challenge, or to your second challenge. You say, I need to be fully aware, I need to fully know that you are in a central position to take on this uh, fundamental mathematics reform. Uh, could you elaborate on that? So in 2009, we launched Wolfram Alpha. As people may know, Wolfram Alpha is this knowledge engine where you type all sorts of things in, you know, it might be a mathematical thing or it might be a thing that appears less mathematical, and it computes an answer. And one of the things that happened from that was a bit surprising to me. Many teachers said, oh, wow, now we can, like, type in a quadratic equation. It'll just solve it. Is it cheating to have Wolfram Alpha used by students for their homework? And so I had thought for many years there was this weird divergence between what we, for example, could do with Mathematica and what was being not done with tools like Mathematica in the classroom. But this really crystallized it because that's a very good question. Is it cheating? Well, it's not cheating, in my view, if you have the right homework, because you should be allowed to deploy whatever tools are reasonably available to you on that homework. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to. And so that's what really crystallized me into action for computer-based maths. And, I, and then I started to realize, oh, my gosh, who in the world is in the position I'm in to be able to understand, think about this, and potentially action it? There are any people in universities who thought about mathematics education, the process of education, the pedagogy of it. But most of those people don't have the general view we at Wolfram had of how mathematics gets used in the real world. After all, you know, We'd deployed our software to tens of millions of people around the world over a long time by then. You know, we'd seen all the ways in which mathematics was increasingly getting used in different parts of life. Mm -hmm. But I've been sort of increasingly horrified over the years to find, as far as I can tell, there's virtually nobody in the world really can fundamentally trying to reform the content of the maths curriculum, assuming computers exist. I mean, everybody else has been doing reforms trying to improve the pedagogy or they've said, well, you know, let's take the original material and make it more exciting because we can now do a bigger problem. But not like, hang on a moment, do we need to be learning this at all? Why don't we learn something completely different? And actually, when you start to think that way, you realize how different it needs to be. The tool sets are all different. Don't teach people, I mean, to give an example, statistical distributions. You know, that's not the first way you should initially try to analyze a million data points. Let's fit a distribution to it and a normal distribution to it and, and chop out most of the data. That was an important way to think about it when you couldn't compute very much. But you don't do that now with computers because they can deal with a million data points. There's no problem. So that's not the first port of call. So everywhere you look and what's the linchpin of this change and am I, am I up to trying to make this happen? And, and you know, I think we've made huge progress and we've built a fantastic amount beyond, I think, what anybody else has done. But we've still got a long, long way to go in terms of both people understanding how to implement it and, and you know, what we've got to build. We are very happy and excited to be partnering with Mindstone for the recording of this episode. Mindstone is a platform that lets you build courses curated from the best articles, podcasts, and videos available online, helping your students learn faster and remember more. You can think of Mindstone and learning in the same way you think of Spotify and listening. With Mindstone, you can use the internet as an infinite library of content that you can curate into playlists with tailored recommendations, and it's shareable with your students. Where Spotify enhances the listening experience, Mindstone exists to enhance the learning experience. Check out Mindstone.com and find out how you can get started.
Yeah, well, well, first of all, my hats off to you for not only seeing the problem, but also taking it on. I think many, many people, they see the problem and then they shrug and basically say, oh, well, you know, I'm just going to continue my journey. But you made the connection saying like, hey, there's going to be a gap if we don't take care of it. So that first and foremost, I think, is already worth our admiration. Another thing that came to mind when you described this journey is because it's such a massive task, who are your allies in this journey? Because you, of course, cannot do this alone, right? You know, yeah, absolutely. That's education reform. And you can talk, you can write about it and whatever, but you also need people who go in the field who start putting it into practice and people who want to sit next to you and take on uh, spreading that message. And I think there, in mobilizing these partners, that might be kind of, the, you know, that's an all other, other exercise. I'm happy to, to see, because when I did my research on the math fix, that already many notable newspapers and platforms and, and people have interviewed you and, and are kind of uh, spreading the word. But I can imagine there's still some work to do there. So, so a lot of work. And trying to get, getting that across, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing I have to say is I want to keep the vision clean. And I think we've yeah. done that rather successfully. In fact, I would say it's cleaner than it was before. I mean, often what happens to these things is, you, you, know, you know, there's certain compromises you have to make, and that's fine. But people need to be clear. I think one of the mistakes with other maths reforms is people have said, well, you know, they haven't had a clean enough vision. They haven't had a bold enough vision. And in the end, the thing just degenerates to a sort of like, let's improve it with adding a calculator in type of answer. Yeah. I'm not interested in that. And I think it's critical we don't fall into that. The support around the world is haphazard and unpredictable. So yeah. by which I mean the following. I mean, on, I, I have been incredibly pleased by the support we've got from many, many different areas. I mean, from virtually every country in the world, we have had some supporters of some level. You know, if we can tie it together into a sort of, uh, you know, five or so points we can all agree on and take that to governments and say, look, we can all agree this is how things ought to change. That helps people trying to make the change to execute. Yeah. And so at the end of my book, you'll find there's a sort of campaign for computational curriculum reform and a number of things people can kind of, in a sense, if they agree with them, sign up to. And, you know, in different countries, this is in very different ways. I mean, in some countries, I think particularly smaller countries, there's a potential really to just go and try something. I think Estonia were very early with us in deciding they would just try and test something out. And I think that was a really positive thing. I think there's a tremendous possibility now with inside organizations, within companies. I mean, just because somebody's become an adult, it doesn't mean they can't learn this, just because they were put off by math. And so we're hearing from an increasing number of mostly large companies, actually, they've recognized in their whole training thing, they need something more than, you know, whether you can code in Excel or whether you can do something very vocational. They need something one step back from that. And they think this computational thinking is a critical aspect of their training. So I think that may be a, a linchpin of activity for us to push it then back down into schools. I'd mm. obviously like to get this upstream. I'd like to get school children to be able to participate in this. But in order to do that, you've got to get governments engaged in most countries. Again, yeah. in the U.S. in particular, there's a big homeschooling and sort of out of the traditional curriculum schooling movement and i think there is real potential in that movement in the u.s to be able to kick things forward so yeah big task still for both the vision and the practical delivery yeah and this is just suggestion from from my side but you know for whatever it's worth when you say we need people from uh you know technology ventures and and kind of it's it's not only a educational problem i think if you demonstrate that there's a this hiatus between, you know, understanding mathematics and really gaining the skills to thrive in your career after school, uh, kind of make that connection because of that computational thinking, you know, make that connection and, and show that example back to the schools. Absolutely. I think that could be a win as well, that, that you demonstrate, like, listen, if we do it this way, then here's what, what the reward could be yeah, for us to, you know, thrive in our careers or better understanding technology I mean, I mean, or getting better jobs or all of the above. Yeah. Very simple example. You know, the problem of understanding cause and correlation. Yeah. So most people managing in most organizations today are faced 
pretty repeatedly with questions as to whether, you know, when they're presented with a bunch of data, effectively, as to what's happened in a decision they took, and it is day-to-day. 50 years ago, it probably wasn't. It was hand-waving. Now it's like numbers Mm. or graphs or equivalent, right? And they're sitting there as a manager trying to figure out what to do. You know, key question is, was what happened here caused by the other action, or is it that somehow it's correlated and caused by something else, right? Yeah. Now, that's a simple thing on which I think billions of dollars of mistaken decisions are taken because people don't really understand how you analyze something like that in a fairly effective way. I mean, to put this very bluntly, nowadays there are very few jobs, at least in the developed world, you'd hire people for who weren't literate. Now, reading and writing is an essential of doing all work, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Coming up, if you're not computationally literate in the sort of way I've described, I think there will be increasingly few jobs that you can actually partake in. Yeah. And I don't think this is just, you know, highly technical jobs. It's I'm talking about day-to-day, normal, either on-the-ground jobs or management jobs in particular. Yeah. So it's that critical. And, I mean, you know, it's very simple why that is, because decisions are now being taken more and more and more based on the computational process, numbers, assessments, models, you know, and uh, we've seen it during the pandemic. I mean, I don't know, uh, certainly in the UK, every evening, basically, you know, there have been graphs and charts and leading you through, you know, complicated rationales about, you know, this number of people got infected. But what does that mean? Because there's problems about how many people got tested. So how do we know what the infection rate is? What's actually happening on the ground? What Should you get a vaccine? Should you not get a vaccine? And so forth. And so. If you even just look at the pandemic as a snapshot and how it was talked about publicly, that is dramatically different to what would have happened, in my view, if we'd been in a similar situation 30 years ago. And yet most of the population are not really equipped with how to handle that. So there's a huge requirement. that. And when I say that, for example, particularly technology companies, I think, haven't quite engaged fully in this, I think the trouble is, We hear from everyone, universities in particular, by the way, that the students they're getting in are hopeless at the kind of mathematics they need for the courses they're going to take. Mm -hmm. And I was actually quite shocked recently because I've assumed, you know, if you're taking a biology course or you're taking a sociology course or I'm quite clear that the traditional mathematics at school is not very relevant to those because it's just Mm -hmm. it's more it's more tied to sort of traditional physics, you know, blocks going down slopes and things like that. What shocked me more is when a lot of top universities were telling me recently that actually even for their physics courses, the mathematics at school isn't right. So it's not even for new uses of mathematics, so to speak. It's for all of them. And that's kind of why I think it's so critical we address this at at all levels. But I think that later on it can be addressed very immediately. And, you know, we've built a lot of materials which are at least a starting point for actually how to immediately deploy some of that from get-go. Yeah. And that, and that is already such a good beginning, and I and I really hope that it gains more traction and that more people will cling on to this way of thinking, or at minimum are open to to question the traditional way they teach mathematics, so that they're that they're open to to changing this. Um, as your third challenge, uh, Conrad, it's basically the book. So the, the math fix, and we've already discussed it in many ways uh, throughout this interview, but I found on your or your blog, you said it's, it, it's taken me 15 years to conceptualize it, then I believe another 10 to, to find a word for it, and then two years to, to write it all down. So that's, you know, it, it's obviously your baby, I and mean, you've put so much thinking into it. A question I had is how have you been able to combine it? Because you're also CEO of a company and, you know, you're doing so many other things. Is it a combinable quest? Well, I mean, practically what I did was I decided to get up, you know, an hour and a half earlier every day. And I basically wrote the book kind of before breakfast, more or less, each day and then went to work. I mean, that was kind of practically what I did. And I think I then sliced off a morning when I wasn't having meetings, which I would either use for for company work or or doing bigger bits of the book. What was interesting about the process of writing book, though, is I thought I'd pretty much all figured it out. And I came to write the book, and I realized there were these huge holes, like there were the things we just hadn't thought through. And so the book, actually, I found very helpful in forcing me through sort of to think of a complete roadmap. I mean, the the section of the book, as you know, are, you know, to start with, I describe the change that's needed. Then I 
describe the fix, then I describe sort of how to make the change and what are the political and other issues around that. And those are sort of three sections of the book. So it was a big challenge. And it, as, as always with these things, it was a much bigger project than I thought it would be. And I'll tell you the other part of it that also took me surprisingly in time. I was persuaded I should make an audio version of the book that came out uh, a few months ago. I found myself, you know, still very much in agreement with what I'd written a few, uh, you know, a couple of years before, effectively. So I, I'm quite pleased with that, at least. That's good. No, and, and I'm happy that it's available in so many forms. And in, hey, in, in ink, in, you refer to, and, and in words, in audible words. And I, you know, moving forward, uh, you could also start a podcast, or you could, you know, just just to dose these bits of theory or the philosophy to other people. I, I think, you know, your quest will be to continuously kind of repeat that message and then, and then hopefully also people will practically pick up on it. So you, you mentioned you got up one and a half hour early. Would you say that it is it has also positively impacted your work for Wolfram Research? Because, you know, I read in the intro you work around Mathematica, which again is such a such an advanced tool. Did that kind of help you as well with your understanding when you're talking about education reform, or is that a completely different ballgame? No, it's not completely different. There are many ways in which it intersects. I mean, one way, of course, is all the things we built for computer-based math are built in the Wolfram language and using our technology. And of course, as inevitably, when you build a big thing with your own eat your own dog food, as it's called in the software industry you discover quite a lot of things about it. And, if, you know, I, we certainly fixed a bunch of things in our technology because of this project. I mean, just at one very basic level. I think it's also always good. I mean, I've been working on Wolfram Research for 30 years. I just passed my 30-year anniversary. Congrats. Uh, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, actually, it's amazing because I, I hadn't thought about this at all. And we were in one of our first post-pandemic, if I can call it post-pandemic yet, uh, sort of physical meetings in the office and uh, suddenly this huge uh, beautiful cake arrived uh -huh. uh, and <laughs> people had figured out it was 30 years and that was a, that was a nice. rather nice surprise um but um you know it's difficult to keep fresh over that period of time when uh -huh. you're trying to innovate all the time and you know uh -huh. maybe i haven't always managed it but to have something very i mean you know related but different to think about is a very good way of trying to refresh yourself a bit. Yeah. So thinking of this from a different angle. Also, the other thing that's very interesting about it is I've, I've got into many conversations about this change of fundamental change of maths. And they've also ended up with people not hadn't quite understood the scope of what we built at Wolfram technologically. I mean, this is no way the initial intention of it at all, but people are amazed by the scope of what our Wolfram technology does. I mean, they think of it sometimes, people who used it for calculus at college think, you know, what we do is we solve integrals and it was great for doing their homework. Actually, we are pretty much the most sophisticated sort of data science system of tool sets and language. The language we have, Wolfram language, is really a, a kind of intriguing and high-level language. And, and the fact that that's sort of come up as, as part of this has been a very positive result of what I've done, but not for that purpose. No, it's a bonus, uh, so to say. You, Correct. It's a great reward, I'd say, yeah. Um, we're almost at the end of this interview, uh, Conrad, and thank you so much for sharing so elaborately your experiences and, and challenges thus far. Before you go, two very last questions that I ask all my guests, and one is around reading. So if you could advise our listeners uh, one book that has inspired you on your journey, and you can't mention your own, I'm afraid, but which book yes. would you want them to know about? That's a good question, and I don't have a great answer for it, because I'm a, okay. I'm a person who tends to dip in and out of books. But I am always interested in biographies. I'm interested in how people have done things. And so when I think about things like, you know, the Steve Jobs biography and books like that. It is ex extremely exciting to me how they made uh, the change they did. And by the way, just to mention, Steve Jobs was the person who came up with the name Mathematica originally. Um, oh. We were buckling on his next machines at the release of Mathematica. And so we've been very, we're very intertwined with Apple um, for a long time. And, and you'll find Wolfram Alpha's behind Siri and things. One of the, the last things that uh, was 
sort of orchestrated, I think, by, by Steve Jobs before his, his untimely death. So I enjoy reading biographies of, of interesting people. So I think that's maybe a class of things that I find interesting, both historical figures and, you know, technology leaders. I agree. Biographies, uh, I learn a lot from biographies. It's, it's always very interesting to see how people got into certain things, right? Uh, Steve Jobs, but also so many other people that you, you just want to find out about their stories. And, and it's also sometimes fiction, even though I like to read fiction. When I read a biography, I give myself the idea that I'm doing something useful, <laughs> whereas with fiction, I'm like, okay, this is complete entertainment. And with biography, I, I kind of kid myself maybe, but I'm, like, I'm learning something. I can use this. I can apply this. And it's a very good, um, good and suggestion. And another person, just to add from, from the past that I, I mean, this is many years ago, I remember reading Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, the famous okay. physicist. Uh, yeah. And uh, Feynman was another character, uh, different, very different from Steve Jobs, but uh, with, with a similar broad outlook on life and the way to think about things. And I think I found that very interesting at the time. Yeah, I think it's Walter Isaacson, yes. who is the, uh, who's the biographer, who's written so many other great biographies. So if you're looking for a great biographer, then definitely read more of his work. I think he also read, uh, uh, written about Leonardo da Vinci. And I think he also has one, a combined one with Stephen Jobs, but also Ada Lovelace and kind of, uh, uh, you know, so, so, so he, he's done a lot of great work on that level. So, uh, but thank you for that suggestion. And sorry, I was kind of quickly trying to get that information in there as well on, on who the biographer is. Um, and then the very last question, Conrad. Now let's turn the tables. This is your podcast. You can invite any guest that you would like to talk about mathematics reform or anything else that you find interesting. Who would you want to invite? And by the by, you were advised by Stavros Yanuka from uh, World Innovation Summit for Education. He mentioned you <laughs> as a guest uh, that he had the great pleasure to talk to, and then he mentioned you. So you were mentioned already as the guest of Stavros, uh, just throwing that out. Okay, well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm bad at these point answers like this. I mean, there are very <laughs> obvious people that would have incredibly many interesting things to say, but, you know, like Elon Musk, for example, who I think has done tremendous things and continues to do so in, in many walks of life. You know, Somebody I uh, – this is not an answer to your question, because sadly they're no longer with us. But somebody I think if I look back through education and thinking about the sort of problems I've been thinking about, who I would have loved to have a chance to talk to is Seymour Papat. Seymour Papat was very famous. I think he even pretty much came up with the term computational thinking. But he invented Logo uh, with his team at MIT and was very early in trying to engage – students with what were the early potential of computers and programming and thinking in that sort of computational way. And I would have loved to be able to run a podcast with him, essentially. I, I am, I know well his daughter and, and partner and many people who worked with him. So when I look back in terms of people who have done anything at all similar to what we've been trying to do, I think they're very much the, the, the you know, top of the tree in that. Yeah. And so it's not a very good answer for you because unfortunately Sam no, is no longer with us. But podcast I would have loved to run. Conrad, it's a great answer, and many other guests on the podcast have chosen not to make it a podcast but a seance because they're, you know, the guests that they chose for uh, sadly already passed, but they still were invited by your guests. So it's a very good answer, and thank you so much for uh, sharing this uh, with us. Um, yeah, uh, Conrad, it's been a great pleasure talking about your your journey in trying to reform uh, mathematics uh, education. I wish you all the very best on that journey. And uh, as you are aware, we are a community of loads of teachers, so 55,000 in over 205 countries. And I very much advise all of them to read the math fix. We will be sure to include in our show notes a link to the book in uh, hard copy, but also in e-copy, as well as to where you can find the, the audio version uh, of the book, so we can all uh, gain a better understanding of computational thinking in mathematics. And, you know, the person who brought it all to us, Conrad Wolfram. Thank you very much.
If you liked this episode of the Teach Pitch podcast, then it would mean the absolute world if you could share it with your friends and or give it a short review on your preferred podcast platform. The more you share your ideas about these interviews, the more people will find out about them. So do let us know what you think. We'd be very, very grateful. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod for our beautiful theme music, La Grand Chase. This podcast was produced and edited by Natalie Piles. Project coordination by Inva Cheney.